Sorry, Smokey, I'm burning that place down. Greetings and salutations, and welcome to the spooky season with Hacker Slash. If you're joining us again, welcome back. I could help you, but I'd rather stand here and record. If this is your first time listening, welcome to the party. We are a horror movie review podcast dedicated to telling you whether a movie is a hack, a total joke, wasted time, or a slash. Totally killer. Pun intended. We believe horror is for everyone, and as such, we're rating these movies with the perspective we've gained from our varying walks of life and the flavors of fear we fancy most. My name is Chris, I'm your friendly neighborhood slash enthusiast, and this week I'm joined by the Superfly Space Guy, Mac. No, Mike, it's not the same log. And the gore lover, Alexis. Oh, he liked it? God bless him. This episode and the entirety of our 2022 spooky season is brought to you by our friends at Calm Strips. Calm Strips is helping us celebrate our 2022 theme of comfort horror. And in that spirit, our first movie of the spooky season may bring you the comfort of nostalgia or potentially the discomfort of triggering your vertigo with shaky cam. Before we crack open the drama meme and dive into the past, though, we have some follow up. Let's follow up on some stuff. This week, we're excited to announce the launch of our second annual New Blood Drive, which is a month-long celebration of horror, our podcast anniversary, and the expansion of our patron family. The drive consists of a few major things. Number one, birthday gifts. We've commissioned an artist to create a poster commemorating our fifth anniversary. Every new patron who signs up in the month of October and stays will receive a poster of their very own. Number two, free sides. Now, if you're still on the fence about joining our Patreon, why not test drive one of our best patron perks? For our listeners who may not know, after every episode, our patrons are treated to a bonus segment known as B-Sides. B-Sides are for things besides the point. Pre-game chats, bloopers, tangents that really take things off the rails. You understand. Experience how the other half lives with Free Sides this month only. And in addition to those benefits, we are also double-stuffing our lineup. This month, we have... Eight episodes, including a patron pick, our birthday special, and another round of the co-host clash. A series of episodes which pit our co-hosts in head-to-head matchups of their favorite comfort horror movies. At the end of the month, our listeners will get to crown a new champion by voting on which movie and episode they enjoyed most. Naturally, with a double stuff lineup, we have a lot of movies under our belt, but we want to take it a step further. Since we have a new Discord server this year, our new Blood Drive is also going to include public watch parties and patron-exclusive live streams and video chats. Stay tuned to the events tab in our Discord to learn more. We're just so excited to have all of you along for the ride as we celebrate our show's fifth anniversary, which is insane to me. You can learn more by following the link in our show notes or by heading over to patreon.com slash hacker slash. And that's our follow-up. Well, our double stuff spooky season lineup is kicking off with a 1999 film considered to be the first widely released film with marketing powered by the internet. In June 1998, a website launched which compiled police reports and news interviews surrounding the disappearance of three missing students. The validity of the missing students was widely debated, but the release of an hour long special a year later led audiences to believe they really had disappeared while making a documentary about a local legend. The success of the unprecedented marketing campaign proved to be the gasoline needed for the growing fire behind the film's legacy. This movie, while not being the first of its kind, went on to become one of the most successful independent films of all time and both revived and popularized the found footage subgenre. This week, we're talking about the 1999 film, The Blair Witch Project. Who's seen this one before? I have a little backstory, if you guys will let me um, explain. Obviously, I've seen this movie... I was dreading watching it because I'm so scared of this movie, mostly because of my childhood. My parents rented this shortly after it came out. My mom was so scared. She kept talking about this to me, like not to me, but like in my presence. And I heard her scream one night because they were watching the movie and I guess something fell off the wall and my mom was terrified. And I'm pretty sure ever since then, she still believes in ghosts even more. But she's terrified of this movie, and I think instilled that fear into me. So, yeah, that's definitely seen this. I actually saw a second one, too, but it's been it's been a while. It's been maybe a few years since I've seen it. 
Well, I have successfully avoided watching this movie for 23 years until today, until I watched it, but it was not on my watch list in any way, shape, or form. I've mentioned it before. Found footage is just not my thing, and anything where a camera shakes for a period of time is just going to upset my, my vertigo. So, yeah, I think it's, I think math wise now it's been 23 years for me. <laughs> That's surprising. I thought you would have seen this, but seeing that this is like the first found footage almost. Yeah, exactly. The first one of, of, of a modern take on a subgenre that I do not enjoy. So yeah, this is definitely not one that I like looked forward to at all. Fair enough. Mac, I didn't avoid this for 20 plus years like you did. Now I've seen this movie before, but I've seen pop culture references more than I've seen the actual movie. I also didn't see it right when it came out. I didn't watch it until like a good three to four years later. I did, though, watch the Scooby-Doo project that aired on Cartoon Network just after this hit movie hit theaters. And I've dropped a link in the show notes. That was an absolute masterpiece of a cartoon parody. That actually sounds really entertaining. Yeah, Mac, the version that I found is 4K upscaled. So it's a lot cleaner than even what I remember seeing on TV. But treat yourself if you haven't actually seen it, because there's something about the realism with which they paint these characters Obviously, this is a group of people like Lost in the Woods, right? And you have the wholesome Scooby-Doo gang, you know, Mystery Inc., and you have them getting tense with each other and kind of making snide remarks together and kind of getting scared. It's a really interesting experience. Uh, it sounds it sounds a lot better than what I was expecting from this movie, having never seen it and having deliberately avoided it for so long. I just I just knew in my heart that it was going to be full of shaky cam really bad acting and especially potato footage. Yeah. Although it was, you know, terrifying and I had some animosity watching this, I did recall that a lot of things didn't happen in this movie. So I actually thought my expectations uh, were going to be really low for this watch. I was like, I don't feel like this age very well because I just remember it being scary, but I never remember why it was scary. Yeah, so having watched this movie before, I felt like there couldn't possibly be anything left for me to appreciate more. If you've heard of this movie, you more than likely know it's a little more than an hour of shaky cam, walking in the woods, and people getting more and more stressed. So I expected straight up to just be bored, right? But I was actually really entertained. And I love the idea of like setting out into the woods to make a documentary about something spooky. Sue me. As someone who went into the woods for a lot less of a motivation. I, I felt like this is a, an idea that I could, I could grab onto. And I felt the relatable moment when like you're working on an important interview and the dude running your camera can't, didn't pull focus right and he fucks up the footage. There's a lot in here that I enjoyed. Obviously, a lot of the uh, hectic camera work. So I can't imagine how Mac must have felt watching this. Well, I mean, I I think it was mostly on par with what I expected. I think there was plenty of shaky cam. I did pretty well. I kept my phone with me to mostly distract myself visually from the film. Um, But I kind of felt like what Alexis thought was going to happen. I kind of felt like I'm waiting for something to happen on screen that isn't just these people yelling at each other for minutes at a time. That was... When I, my biggest feeling, I think, while watching it was mostly just like, good God, these people are fighting and yelling and screaming and it's so loud and they just need to chill out for, for 90 minutes. That's exactly how I felt while watching. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you, did close my computer and finish watching it later on because I was like, you know what? It's making me feel anxious and I don't know if it's a good anxious or a bad. I don't know if I'm anxious because man, I'm really hoping something's going to pop on the screen or just these people yelling at each other is just like, and I'm like, are they going to get out of the woods? Like, and it wasn't for the actual movie, just the circumstances they were in per se. But it really surprises me and disappoints me that this movie had such low quality because I feel like during the time, the video could have been way, I feel like the video was better back then. It feels like they almost purposefully probably made this bad. It's almost as if they did that because they did, because they needed to age it since it was supposedly shot years before. I don't think you needed to do that, you know, but I bet whoever is like in their 20s today, whatever they are, I bet they're thinking this is what VHS looks like and it doesn't. I know, but (laughs) I mean, I'm watching this and I'm thinking to myself about like the work that had to be done to make this movie or maybe the work that didn't have to get done. There had to be so much editing done. Um, But really I'm thinking of like, 
Chris could go out and make a movie like this. Like Chris has the skills. Is she sitting there like tearing this movie apart or like analyzing components of it? Like I, I really wondered Chris, if you had like while watching this gone through a whole like technical thing in your mind versus being able to, to just try to soak up the story. I think this movie does enough to suspend my disbelief to where I don't really care to get lost in the technicalities of it. There is a inexplicable moment, actually a couple moments where someone is wasting a very precious resource in this movie and it drives me fucking insane. And that is the one thing that like really broke the realism for me. Aside from that though, I was also surprised uh, how much better a time I had watching this, particularly in the comfort of my own home with the speakers really close and the captions turned on because there's a critical point in this movie when tensions rise and you can hear a very faint sound. And this is the first time I've ever been able to hear that. And that kind of sound work, that kind of audio work, Mac, is the technicality that I dove into on this rewatch. So it was less about the camera work. It was less about what they were trying to do in terms of like structuring their documentary and more thinking about the meta of how this film was made. It's really fucking impressive when you think about the resources and the amount of improv that had to happen to bring this movie together. I think I, if I were to like do this again, I probably would want to watch it with headphones on. I think that would add probably a lot to it. There were definitely moments where I struggled a little bit with trying to hear what they were talking about because they were saying, Oh my gosh, do you hear that? And I'm like, no, I don't hear anything. And I'm, that was kind of a bummer for me, but you know, there was, there was another bummer for me. And that was, it was a disappointment in the antagonist because I think with a name like this and the way things are dressed up, I was, really expecting a certain type of antagonist that we just truly don't see on screen depicted in the way I, I had hoped for, which I think kind of detracted from from the level of fear that I had. I, I mean, obviously, I'm never scared when I'm watching a movie, but I didn't really feel like this was a scary movie. I actually kind of thought to myself, like, why was anybody scared when they watched this? See, I think the less you see, the scarier it is. I also agree, though, that, that this is not a scary movie. But I also can imagine how this would have been scary had you watched it of conscious mind in the late 90s when it came out. And you had and you had some of the factors surrounding uh, the movie and whether or not you believed if it was real or if you were misled, etc. There's a lot in here, though, that... Choices were made that I don't think they could have executed well had they gone a different direction. And there is so much footage that is shot for this film that was never used, period. And even more footage that was used for marketing. And so you get a lot of that when you think about like what the original vision of the project was. There's even a point in the movie that you were supposed to see something. But with the style of filmmaking that was employed for this film, you end up not seeing anything at all. And knowing that the actors see things that we don't, I think, adds to the tension. I would agree with you, Chris. It definitely brought up some tension, but I don't know. I think for something like this, I just need, I needed something more to make it frightful, which was hilarious because I went into this movie, I kept the lights on, I made sure I ate dinner and I did not have to go downstairs. I mean, I was set up to be frightened the other night and... I was not, but it, it did build tension. I, I don't know. I, I struggle with sometimes, you know, when we watch movies and review them, they put, they put the antagonist too much on screen. They didn't put enough. This is not what I imagined, but I feel like some subtle hints would have been good for me that I really was solidified that there's something there and these people aren't just crazy. It didn't come across to me as crazy as much as it came across to me as like, maybe there's nothing to look at. And so I, I didn't, I didn't while watching this realize that there actually were things that they were seeing that we didn't get to see. So I think knowing that changes a little bit makes it a little bit better. I think though the like cultural impact of this movie really gives it full originality points because it's not the first movie to do found footage for sure. It's definitely not the first movie to talk about ghost hunting or witch hunting or anything like that. But I think it's the first one to have this sort of impact on, on the culture. And I think using the internet fully brilliant. I remember like the whole advertising campaign was massive and people were talking about this for so long after it came out and actually leading up to it coming out. So on its own, just like the way that it hit was, I think the first of its kind. Oh, absolutely. It may not have been the first 
found footage film, but it's definitely the grandfather of modern found footage. And Mac, you mentioned the marketing strategy behind it and absolutely does put it in that original territory. Yeah, I do believe the cultural phenomenon of this movie is kind of out of this world. I mean, people know this movie and don't even really watch horror movies. I mean, shit, it scared the mess out of my mom. She won't even watch scary movies. And I'm pretty sure my stepdad remembers that. I mean, if I can remember this from when I was a kid, I'm sure. So I'm sure other people have similar circumstances or certain memories surrounding this and seeing it in theaters, I'm sure was crazy back then too. And this being something essentially new to the time. So I will definitely give it originality, but the ending, I don't know. It was like so crazy, but like I said, with how frightening it was, I I was missing a lot in the ending that I just, I mean, I got the ending, but I don't know how to describe it. Like it was, it was missing something to me. And I think it was missing what made the whole movie frightful. Mm, I don't know. I disagree. I think the the ending was exactly what I wanted it to be without needing anything more. Because at that point, it's like this, this critical moment, really. Because if you go much further or if you try to go a different direction, then it becomes this like uh fourth wall breaking thing where you begin to wonder how the hell this footage is even even got here right like it can only realistically go on so long just saying if the camera like they do now just tilted a certain way that's all i need i do feel you on like the danger of going too far because then i think you get to the kind of ending we had in like hell house llc where we might have gone like a little bit too far on that one but i think the ending of this one was probably the best part of the movie the very end scene i think was my like the most unexpected scene for me in this film, like with the the whole vibe of the film, I did not expect that to happen. And I was very pleasantly surprised by that. I think there's a moment leading up to it where I'm like still criticizing it out loud while watching it. And then we get to the end and I was like, Oh, nice. Like that, that was well executed. I liked it. And I think it's, it's something my band director told me many, many years ago where he says, you know, you, you can start out well and then end well. And it leaves you some freedom in the middle to not do perfectly. But if you start well and end well, that's what people will remember. Well, let's see if it ended well enough to score favorably on our show. But before we get into our ratings, Alexis, what's the gore score for this film? It's pretty low for what it is during this time. But I will admit there are a few things that we'll get into into the second half that could, you know, raise this up a little bit. And what about the animal report? Like with any which movie you can imagine, um, PETA is going to be pissed, but it, it's okay to watch. Well, let's go ahead and get into our ratings. And The Blair Witch Project from 1999, was it a hack or a slash? So this movie has obviously some nostalgia for me, um, half of it being my mother. Um, and I think that was the only thing entertaining about this movie was my mom's perception of this. I think I might have hyped it up a little too much. You know, I was dreading this. I was dreading it in a good way. Like, I was like, I'm going to be so scared. You know, I applaud it for that terror it even brings to me today. But, you know, we were watching this and I just was found myself just being bored. And Heather, her voice just is cringy to me. Like, I don't know, something about it just didn't feel real. She didn't, she felt to me like she was acting real hard in this. And, you know, I applaud what it does in the genre, but I've seen better found footage. Unfortunately, it comes after this and I will applaud the Poughkeepsie tapes because you start off and you don't even know there's no credits. There's no like explanation. You're just in these tapes. I feel like had they been a little bit more in the time frame, they probably could have added some more things like the Poughkeepsie tapes has done to make it a little bit more timeless and, you know, cross generational, but it's going to get a hack for me. Wowzers. I mean, I kind of saw that coming from you, but this is one of the most annoying movies I've ever seen. The characters, all three of them constantly great on my nerves. The plot is insanely boring. Like you've mentioned, the camera angles are vomit inducing for me, but maybe that's just me. I don't know. Uh, but I truly don't understand why this was such a phenomenon after people watched it. This is a prime example of why at least I think found footage is a garbage subgenre. Filming people unreasonably freak out while literally nothing happens on screen. I think it's cheap and effective and mostly aggravating. I hated it. And it's a total hack. But you didn't like Cloverfield? It was okay. okay. I think 10 Cloverfield Lane was, was a huge improvement. Okay, Mac, tell us how you really feel. So look, this movie is really simple. 
but it's not scary. It's masterful in some ways, but it's so difficult to watch now. But because it's simple, it's good at being effective the first time. And yet it's debatable whether it's effective for a first time viewing in present day. I'd venture to say it's really not. This movie is filled with quality performances that rely on some really intense improv skills. And for me, this movie is a slash. I'm not expecting anyone to love it as a modern horror film, but that's because you can't. It is not a modern horror film. Instead, you can go back and watch this movie and appreciate it for what it is. It's like a time capsule of originality and fresh horror in a time when our world was slightly less disillusioned, skeptical, and hardened than it is now. It was a time before the internet, a time when, sure, things were obviously fake, but it allowed for the moments of mystery uh, because you didn't just have the answers at your fingertips. You can't make this movie now. And that's what makes it even more special, particularly as a found footage film. But with that, The Blair Witch Project from 1999 has earned two hacks and one slash. So we're really starting October off with a real big bang here. You can find this movie streaming on Hulu, so go check it out. Then join us in the second half so we can break down things together. We'll see you in a bit. It's generally believed that watching horror movies can relieve anxiety. No, really, it's true. But what about those situations when spooky flicks aren't readily available? Well, here's a hack that can help slash those Sunday scaries, and they're called calm strips. Calm strips are textured, sensory adhesives, super discreet fidgets that are reusable and residue-free. You can put them virtually anywhere. Phone cases, laptops, notebooks, crucifixes, and more. Pick at the corners, scratch the surface, or simply feel the texture for sensory feedback and stimulation whenever, wherever. It's a helpful tool for anxiety, ADHD, fidgeters, body-focused repetitive behavior, and reducing restless energy, something Josh, Heather, and Mike could have used when they were lost in the woods in the Blair Witch Project. Calm Strips have over 150,000 satisfied customers since 2020 and are used in over 5,000 classrooms. Save 20% when you shop at calmstrips.com and use promo code slash during checkout. That's calmstrips.com, promo code slash. Our thanks to Calm Strips for sponsoring this episode and the entirety of our spooky season. Welcome back, folks. You are now entering the spoiler zone for the Blair Witch Project, which has tragically earned two hacks and one slash. And we have a lot to unpack here, but before we get into the specifics of our ratings, Alexis, take us through the kills. The off-screen presumed kills of all three of these people. Uh, so lame. But, like we mentioned, it would put this movie into an like otherworldly sort of atmosphere and some kind of like fakeness i feel like if you saw someone being dismembered or you know people are hit on the head you don't see them i love seeing josh's teeth i wish we got an ear or something or a tongue like i wish we had something like more obvious that more harm was done to him i think the hardest part for me about that was i feel like it took a second to register what it was and and eventually it was like oh that's a tooth and I think that's probably from being spoiled from most other like Hollywood productions where when you see a tooth, it's like a clear tooth and you see like the roots and stuff and you're like, Oh my goodness, that's someone's molar. So maybe this movie does it the right way because there's so much blood and like it's kind of hard to discern at first, but it did, it and did like take a that, second. Yeah. And wrapped up in that log. I was like, I would never have thought that there was something in there. It oh didn't yeah. Look like it. When she threw it, I was like, okay, smart choice. <laughs> Smart choice, indeed. And what I loved about that moment was the fact that it was just her natural reaction. Like, she noped her way out of that. And then they kind of had an oh shit moment on set where the guy who was monitoring them had to report back to the director, hey, she threw the bundle. And then they had to instruct her to go back to it later and grab it and actually open it up. And I think that's when she realizes that the bundle is wrapped in his shirt. It's like real life D&D and somebody goes the wrong path. You're like, oh, crap. How do I get him back? You create a plot hole and you make it so. You play God, back. You play God. Oh, yeah. We've had a a little bit of practice doing that sometimes. (laughs) I do have to admit it was kind of creepy. And I know you get a lot of deaths that are talked about, especially the children that die. And I like how that's kind of reflected in the end of this movie. But 
I mean, I really do wish we had some more violence in this movie. I know that that's probably weird of me to say, but I feel like that would have made this a little bit more creepier. And I don't mean, I don't need terrifier level stuff. I don't need, I, I don't actually maybe even need to see it per se, but like if there was blood or something on someone, like especially at the end when he's just standing there, maybe if there were some blood on him, like some sort of obvious notation that he's dead. I don't know. I feel like I got enough blood with the real human teeth that were in that thing. Did it really bother you that much? It's not that it bothered me. It was just enough. Like that was a good amount. That let me know, okay, there's danger. And I don't want to fuck with it, do I? <laughs> I actually really liked the, the the final scene, I think, was effective for me because the camera drop did it, right? So I think seeing Mike in the corner, that's one thing is it calls back to the story we heard earlier. And it's like, uh Oh, it's going to happen. And we know that this is found footage. So they're not going to survive. So something's going to happen to Heather. But I think when the camera dropped so suddenly that really sold it to me. And I actually, I really liked that. I just wish there had been like a really good thump or something, just like a much louder final blow to the back of the head or something or blood spray, something we could hear that would really cement it, just really sell it. But I think the camera, the camera drop was, was pretty good though. Yeah. Like some stickiness. So, you know, if like something got stuck in the head and got pulled, like something a little bit more exaggerated because with all the screams, it was all exaggerated. So what I'm hearing is the sound effects and scoring of our first birthday episode in the opening summer camp massacre was more up your alley than the Blair Witch Project. Oh, a thousand percent. You don't have to show me everything on screen, but sound does so much of the work for me. Speaking of what did it for you, None of these kills really did it for me. Um, I just love to see Heather gone. No offense, Heather. Um, you were annoying in this movie. But that was my favorite death. I don't know if y'all had a favorite. I know there's only three. I mean, I was stoked about Josh disappearing in the middle of the night, particularly because we have these moments where we hear his screams of agony and pain. And I love knowing that, you know, the team themselves didn't know that he was going to be missing. So he had to wait for them to fall asleep, then sneak out of the tent. And the actors who were playing had no idea that he was going to be gone. So I think the tension of that and the mystery of him just disappearing, all his shit is left behind. And then we hear the screams and then we see the teeth and the blood. So good. Yeah. If only we could uh, rate this movie on everything that happened, not in the film, but while filming it. I I'm going to go for one that doesn't really count because we don't get to see it, but I'm going to say Mike's Mike's death, I think is probably my favorite because it happens presumably after everything that we see happen. So I think, you know, we get Josh, then we get Heather, and then we get Mike. And we know that Mike has to face the corner while Heather is killed, and then Mike will be next. And all that's just relating to the story that we hear in the very beginning of, of the movie. And so I think that one's even worse because... Heather's like Heather's taken out and that's pretty quick, but Mike has to sit there, listen to Josh and then listen to Heather all while being like frozen in place in the corner. And then we assume is going to go next. And that that's a pretty sucky experience. I think having to sit there and listen to everything, knowing what's coming. Yeah. It's really cruel. Very cruel. And I think that house and that house has to be definitely just it's it's creepy and it's visually probably the most appealing thing about this movie especially seeing as most of it's shaky cam but specifically when they get to that top floor and i just knew some shit was gonna pop off i thought on the third floor but i was mistaken but all these hands on the wall and you're like oh my gosh these are the kids so you start putting this story together which i do appreciate about this movie you don't know where it's going and you're like oh wow these stories are true but they're not so in your face about it but just those little hands just the, just the little hands were perfect for me the hands were spooky and it was a really good callback, especially because I think the first time I saw this movie, I'd completely forgotten about the story in the beginning. I mean, I watched this when I was way younger, so I didn't really connect the dots there. But to see this now as an adult and to understand the thread that is running through this movie and to know the the backstory and kind of the lore behind it, I really enjoyed that moment as well. But I think my favorite visual is really just the intercutting of 
the two different types of cameras and the way that we get these moments that are supposed to be the proper film moments, the proper documentary moments. And then we see the chaos of what's actually happening behind the scenes. And I love what that lends in terms of like the perspective we're able to get about these characters from these characters, presumably when the tape is no longer rolling on the main documentary camera. So interesting because I specifically picked the black and white film as my favorite visual element, specifically just that one. The one where it's like the handy cam, like the portable thing, that's it's a bit hard for me because it does feel like a potato cam most of the movie. And I know it's like kind of done on purpose, but we get to those segments where we're filming the documentary itself and we've got that 16 millimeter rolling. That's when it started to feel more like a movie. I mean, it's still like we're getting blurry shots and stuff, but it just feels a bit more polished and the black and white. I, I love black and white. And I think it just does something to add to the gravitas of the idea of a, uh, of a, of a witch or a ghost. Oh, for sure. And I, I do think that camera plays a very significant part in one of my favorite scenes. And this is going to sound super ridiculous because it has nothing to do with the woods or anything like that. But it's the first crack in the wall between Heather and Josh. And it's the moment where he's not acknowledging that he messed up the footage and they're in the car. And he's talking about how the lens has meters instead of feet and how he's trying to like calculate and like measure the depth of field chart because he messed up the previous interview. And she says, oh, it has our system too. And he's insistent. No, it doesn't. It's all meters. And then he eventually admits the brown ones are feet. And she says, the brown ones are on there, aren't they? And he's like, yeah, but the white ones are more obvious. It's like, They're getting at each other in that moment and she's being very steadfast and she's proving her point and standing her ground and he's kind of squirming around her and the tables turn later in the woods. But I love seeing this dynamic because it's kind of like the precursor to what's to come, even if it seems so insignificant in that moment. So, Chris, also my favorite part is this dynamic between all of them specifically when the map is lost and you really get to see Heather like absolutely lose her freaking mind. And I feel like all these little, you know, tidbits add up to this point and then it's just, everything just hits the wall from there. When she hits that point when they're like, that's not the same log. And then she has to admit to herself, it is the same log and and starts crying. You're like, Oh man, it's finally in her brain that like how lost she is and, and how doomed she feels. And she's like now starting to process exactly what's going on and realizes like, I'm pretty much helpless at this point. And you got to feel for her because up until that point, like she's, she's kind of in charge of this and trying to keep them together and trying to keep them going, trying to be the leader. And this is the point where it's like, crap, like what on earth can be done now? Because we have no way forward. Yeah. And I feel like when she was crying too, I found myself putting myself in her shoes and essentially I was like, would I cry during this or would I be so determined to get the hell out of there? And I feel like it's more the second. I feel like I'm not crying in front of these dudes. I'm going to put my boots on and start trekking. Okay. You think, you think that, but you also haven't been in the woods for eight days with no food. Very true. Actually, I would be crying on day two because I'm hungry. Oh yeah. No, the hangry tears are unreal. I was kind of upset though. About their navigation skills, it did bother me a good bit. And I think part of that is just me thinking from a 2022 perspective and not thinking from a 1999 perspective. There's no smartphones. There's no digital maps that you can use. If you only had one map and someone kicked it into the water, you're kind of just out of locking up a creek. So that that is kind of a bummer. But I was really curious, like, Why was there only one person that really knew how to navigate? Well, here's the problem, Mac. It has nothing to do with the map or even their ability to navigate because these are witch woods, bro. Everything was fine. They were navigating just fine until Josh accidentally desecrated that grave with the rocks. The fact that they stayed going in circles when obviously they had been walking in a straight line shows you that even if they had a map, even if these were professionally trained navigators they would not have gotten out of those woods. I think it shows the point of like, you're stuck here. You're in the Blair Witch territory. At that point, I think, sorry, Smokey, I'm burning that place down. Just taking the whole woods with me. But my, my favorite scene was honestly getting into the house, leading up until that that end scene. And I think they hear that voice, and, and that was great. Because you knew, 
even though they're hearing him, like the dude's gone. It's not him. You're being led to your death. But I love that we're going up the stairs and we see the handprints and we're getting to the attic. And you and I, Alexis, both have the same thought. Something crazy is going to be at the top level. Always is. Always Always. is. Right. And then, but no, they get up there and they realize it actually, no, it's coming from downstairs. And and of course it is because we already heard the story. It happens in the basement. You face the corner, he kills the other one. And so like that whole like chaos, but they're still going through it because they obviously didn't think back to that story. They're only worried about finding Josh and they're just the sheer panic and dread that they were feeling. I think that whole end scene from getting to the house all the way up into them dying was the most effective for me. Okay. I stand by my belief that nothing good happens in basements. Uh, that's the first point. The second, the sheer terror, the panic, man, it, it was great in that final scene, but it also felt really great in my second favorite scene, which was the tent attack when they're all running out. And this is the first time that I've been able to hear the laughing kid voices right before the tent is attacked. And I saw, I was like, oh, what, what is that? And I saw it pop up in the captions and I was like, oh, shit, that is actually fucking brilliant and made me appreciate the experience of watching this movie even more. But Mac, I mentioned earlier that there are things that the actors were saying that we didn't. There's a point where Heather's running and the camera's like following behind her and she says, what the fuck is that? And then it's at that point that the camera was supposed to have turned and you would have seen a glimpse of the Blair Witch all in white. Because we didn't see that, you can't possibly be disappointed by poor makeup, bad effects. Maybe the camera picked up a little bit too much and you see it's just a person in a costume. You lose all of that and all you see is the terror. All you feel is the terror, which I think really adds to the reality for this movie that less is more. I think I missed out on a little bit of perhaps the emotion we get in the characters' faces because a lot of times when we have the camera, it's from a, it's from a good distance or we're capturing darkness or we're capturing like the woods while we're hearing the voices. And a lot of times when you get that like found footage or DIY footage, it's pointing the camera at yourself, pointing the camera at yourself. And it's a bit too unreal. And I feel like when you have the, when you have a camera, you're rolling, you're, you're taping pretty much everything. These actors are definitely capable of portraying some, some emotion, especially fright. And they did it, I think very effectively, but I was I was kind of bummed that we didn't get a little bit more time to like get to know like how they're reacting to everything like kind of one on one. I don't know if I need that either. I mean, maybe to build the stakes up a little bit, but I mean, they're fucked either way. I mean, they knew that they were. <laughs> well, I think we got it. We have Heather's iconic confessional. When we are not only not far away from her face, but we're accidentally so close to her face and she's ugly crying, right? Like the snot coming out kind of crying, the tears in your eyes kind of crying and the reality settling in with this crushing hopelessness and helplessness that you done fucked up and there's no coming back from this. I feel like we got so much reaction time from these characters. I could have done with a little bit less of it. I think that was my probably favorite part of Heather because in the beginning when she's talking and I I don't know, it was just that news reportery like tone of voice that I just couldn't deal with. And I know we'll talk about best part, worst part, but it was like certain points where she was speaking were like the worst parts for me. I don't know. It was just so off putting, but when you get her a little bit more emotional, I do like that. It's more grounded in reality than it was previously. I'm interested because I know you guys probably know a little bit more about this film than I do. So were they acting or were they, did they know the things that were going on? I'm I'm very confused. I think the answer is yes and no. The answer is like some things they knew were coming up and other things they didn't. And they were like legitimately surprised by a lot of the stuff that they came across. But I think certain things they would brief them on, but not too much because they still need it to be like a real reaction. They're still doing so much work on their own to come up with dialogue, which is honestly awesome. The fact that they were able to come up with like this much dialogue, a lot of it is just kind of like repetition, which gets a good bit old, which is why I found it to be kind of grating. 
But I think the fact that they could like go into an area of the woods not really knowing what to expect in, in some cases and be surprised by something is is pretty impressive. And to not only come up with the amount of dialogue, but the quality of the dialogue. Like there's that moment when Josh is talking about how Heather views being behind the camera as like a filtered reality in a way to distance herself from what's actually happening. So fantastic. But they were given some vague instruction, right? And think about how you know, how Paris has gone to these improv classes of late. This is like the ultimate game of improv. It's like whose line is in any way but horror. That's really interesting. I think that adds another layer to me that's enjoyable to this movie. But honestly, that's just the background. So... <laughs> But I, I missed a bit of background. I know you guys think we got a little bit too much of like emotional reaction, but I didn't get enough like building of who these people are aside from this moment. And I know that's a lot to ask from a found footage film, right? But I'm kind of You'd a fan. Be pissed of, if they get, told you this is my life story, you're like, this ain't real. I don't want to know their life story, but like having some dialogue between people about other things in their lives. Like I know Mike isn't, you know, Heather's best friend or anything yet. They just met. But like Josh knows Heather. How do they know each other? What's going on in their lives? Do they have a favorite sports team that they like to visit together? I don't know. Those are the small details. Okay. So those details are provided and offered in the 1999 special that aired on TV before this movie's released called Curse of the Blair Witch. And it dives into the lore of the Blair Witch and it's like its own mini documentary surrounding the disappearance of these kids. So I mentioned earlier how that website was posted in 1998 and it creates like the, oh, that's probably fake. This thing airing as a special on TV and not being presented as fictional had people believing that this shit was real. But here's the cool thing, Mac. It's a whole fucking extension of the movie because it interviews their relatives and talks about how they know each other. And you hear from Josh's girlfriend and how she had briefly met Heather, but she didn't get a good impression of her. Uh, they talk to Mike's family. They talk to the professor who, you know, Heather's even doing this whole fucking thing for. And it gets some glimpses at what her proposal was and what her plan was for the Blair Witch Project. Honestly, watching that makes this movie even fucking cooler. I've added a link in the show notes if you want to check it out for yourself. Now I feel like I should go back on my... Maybe this will be what I rehash at the end of the year. I'm not sure. See, I think if it wasn't too long, that could have added a lot of value to this as a single viewing experience. Because part of, part of the movie that I enjoyed the most, I think the best part of the movie, was honestly the interviews with the townspeople at the very beginning. That was actually really enjoyable. The people they interviewed seemed very interesting and like had good stories. And that part seemed way more real than what happened afterwards. And it's really impressive knowing that like Heather and Josh and Mike didn't know that these people had been like tapped by the director to be their interview subjects. They didn't know that they were in on it. They just thought these were like real human beings that knew about this, this legend because they didn't know it was totally fake at the time. Well, the news flash for you, Mac, and this movie is only 75 minutes if you don't count the credits. And then that thing is only an hour long. So really, you could watch both things together and it'd still be shorter than some of these movies that we're out here watching, like Suspiria, the remake, painfully long. <laughs> but also, I think it does go back into that potential, right? Because so a lot of the footage that was used in that special was filmed originally for the movie. And the movie was supposed to start with the wrapper of like these new stories and a little bit more of that like documentary approach. But I think it was a wise decision to split the two, particularly because of how they decided to market this movie. I don't think this movie's marketing or the movie itself would have been nearly as successful had they kept it all combined. It does make me think specifically of Hell House LLC and how they tried to do that all in one go and it wasn't particularly effective, especially because the news broadcast seemed so utterly fake. Oh, absolutely. But like Alexis mentioned earlier, the Poughkeepsie tapes did that and nailed it like fucking perfectly. So it's possible, but it probably just depends on the content, the real important content. Yeah, you just get rid of the credits. Right. Well, yeah. you need the credits, but I think in this case, like, like you said, it wouldn't be the same movie. It wouldn't have the same effect had they tried to squeeze it all into two hours. So the best part of this movie is definitely going to be all these little uh stick figures you see. Like, that must have taken a lot of time. And I think that's pretty terrifying to see 
that when you wake first wake up, knowing that that wasn't there when you went to bed, but also the contraption that they made for the teeth, like unwrapping that and all of that, that just seems very intricate that it would take time. And to know that someone's either out there doing that while you're sleeping and putting these all up, or if it's magic because it's a witch and it just happens. And also that's terrifying too, which I appreciate. I really enjoyed when we got to the scene where they were walking through the woods and started to see all of them hanging around everywhere. Because I, I, we've seen that in a lot of movies and, and TV shows where they have these types of like, you know, wooden stick made figures. But that was really lacking for me up until that point. There was like, I get it. You're hearing something at night. We don't really see it. Okay. Whatever. When they get to that in the woods, I'm like, now you're in which country? Now we've, now we've arrived and now some bad stuff is going to go down because there was, like you said, like a lot of work put into making a ton of these little figures and spreading them around and hanging them up. And it was pretty darn effective. Okay, but what wasn't effective for me was the majority of the extreme close-ups that we get in this movie. Now, we know that we have the accidental extreme close-up of Heather's face with the monologue and the crying and the power and the passion. I get it. However, there are two extreme close-ups that I could have fucking gotten rid of and been okay. One, Mike's chest hair patterns. Disgusting. I hate body hair. There, I said it. I did not need the camera to zoom in on every particle of it. But the second, Heather wasted precious tape. It is not infinite for her in these woods. She wasted precious tape on an extreme close-up of a bag of fucking marshmallows in the grocery store. Why? That bothered me because with the dialogue and the sound effects, it literally seemed like she was just moving the camera and like poking the marshmallow with it. Like, ooh, look how soft it is. Squishy the marshmallow. And was just like pushing the camera into the bag. And that was a really weird choice. Like you're, you're supposed to be looking at this after your documentary is made and, you know, going through the filming and thinking, wow, what did we get up to? It was so silly or so much fun or whatever. And it's like, and you're going to have to watch a scene of you smushing a camera into a bag of marshmallows. Strange choice. Even if you had fully digital unlimited space. Yeah. Like I think about how annoyed I get when I accidentally film a little bit too much of something or, yeah, you know, there's some times where I'm tripping over my own words and I'm thinking, fuck, this is going to be one more thing that I have to edit later. Right. Even if it's not a big deal, it's just like a little stroke. Uh, it's one more thing that I have to do and it adds friction to the process. Heather, you're an amateur is what this moment shows me. Yeah, they all seemed kind of a, a little bit amateur. And I get that they're students and that's okay. But I'm not going to watch this again. It definitely felt too much like a student project. I might make my mom watch this again. I want to see her reaction. But honestly, I don't even need to do that. I don't need to watch this again. I'm open to getting drunk and watching what comes next. Uh, but... For this, I think I'll hold off on ever watching The Blair Witch Project again. I think I would re-examine it through the context of just filmmaking and understanding what went into it and diving more into that. I would love to do that. I'd love to see some additional featurettes or commentary on this movie. But I would watch The Scooby-Doo Project 30 times over before sitting down for just a regular wash of this. That does sound like a great choice. Yeah. How long is this? I might watch this after after recording. It's like 18 minutes. It's amazing. You should absolutely watch it. In fact, you listening, pause this episode. Go watch the Scooby-Doo Project. It's linked in the show notes. Then rejoin us for Factor Fiction. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now you're back. Fantastic. I hope you enjoyed the Scrappy-Doo cameo. Regardless of whether or not I'm going to rewatch it, I am excited to see what Mac has in store for us with Factor Fiction. Number one. Heather's acting career took a dive after the film, thanks to threats and trouble finding gigs. Totally believe that. It was trash. Fact. So trash that she deserves threats, Alexis? That's toxic. Nah, <laughs> very toxic of me to say. Okay, yeah, this this is a fact. I do feel bad for her because I think a lot of the crap that she probably got... It's kind of like what you're saying, where you get annoyed at the character's reactions or the character's voice or the way that she's doing her like journalism style. Um, but I think you're acting, you're in a movie, you're improving. Like she did an amazing job, but she did move on in 2008. And at the time she went into the medical cannabis industry. Number two, one of the cameras used for the film was bought at Circuit City. Rest in peace. After filming was done, the producers attempted to return it, but were denied a return due to the obvious signs of heavy use. I doubt they try to do this, but uh, Circuit City, wow, what a throwback. So, fiction. This is a fiction, 
But yes, they actually did return it, which oh. helped bring down the budget a little bit more. Not much more, I'm sure. <laughs> well, when you have a 60K budget, every penny counts. Very true. Number three. I'm not the only one who has to fight nausea when watching this film. Some people actually had to take vomit breaks. I used to work at a movie theater. When Cloverfield came out, um, I was cleaning up the rope left and right. So this is definitely a fact. Oh, yes, it's a fact. And even in like theaters in Toronto, moviegoers who got motion sickness were asked ahead of time to sit near the aisle and try not to puke on anybody. Jeez, it's almost like they should have gave you bags for this movie. Yeah, instead of like a popcorn pail, they just give you like a vomit pail. Exactly. Here's your bucket. <laughs> Number four. Heather, Mike, and Josh had to take a pause during filming to chat with the director about what they considered unfair psychological duress from unexpected surprises performed by the crew to increase the realness of their on-screen fear. I would believe that because this movie, first go-around, is really tense. So I can imagine acting in it and not knowing what was going to be next or who was going missing or anything like that. So I'd say that was a fact. This one is a fiction because they actually had to sign a release ahead of time, giving the producers permission to mess with their heads. That is a big fuck no. Yeah, that, no thanks for me. And in, in one case, the director actually came up and they like shook the tent and they had no idea what was happening. They didn't know the director was outside and they captured that on film and they're like, freak out is real because they're in the middle of the woods. They don't even know that they're out there shaking their tent. This literally just seems like a jackass movie. But uh, less sexual. Right. Oh, God. I mean, what's even crazier is like that amazing final scene when they get into the basement. They were not even told what to expect when they when they got down there. So Mike was told, OK, go up and down the stairs, yell for Josh, then go down to the basement and don't let Heather stay too close to you. Right. So like, you know, the entire time she's like yelling for Mike, it's like, hey, get back here, like stick with me and all that. That was on purpose. When he gets to the basement, two PAs dressed in black grabbed him and then told him hey like stand in the corner then when heather gets down there they grabbed her and then you know took the 16 millimeter and put it on the floor and basically told her shut up stop screaming but there were sound issues so they had to do it all over again interesting and apparently it was so bad she was so freaked out she had to she was like hyperventilating and they had to you know redo it and get her to stop and get her to calm down i mean that, that chick had snot rockets coming out of her nose so i mean i guess i am being a little harsh when I say her acting was trash. I I'm saying the first half was trash. When she got emotional, I was there for it. That takes some, that takes a lot of work. I don't think the acting in the first half was trash though. I think she was successful playing it exactly as she intended to play it. I think you just don't like the character, like the person that the character is. Possibly. Well, that's been Factor Fiction. Well, there you have it folks. The Blair Witch Project, much to my dismay, has earned two hacks and one slash. We certainly had a lot to talk about here, but it doesn't end here by any means. We want to know what you think, so let us know. You can join in on the conversation for free by hanging out with us over in our Discord. Click the link in our show notes to sign up. If you've enjoyed listening to this episode, consider becoming one of our patrons. Visit patreon.com slash hacker slash to enjoy more of the show with early access, extended episodes, bonus content, and live shows. Thanks again to our friends at Calm Strips for making our 2022 spooky season possible. We'll see you next time, folks. And remember, this is America. We've exhausted all our natural resources. Bye. Okay, so for as not scary as this movie can actually be, I can attest that there are some spooky spots in Maryland. I haven't been to Burkittsville, Maryland, but there is something that is kind of spooky there that doesn't uh, get any mention in this film, and it's called Spook Hill. I don't know if you've all heard of this. I have not. I've not really paid attention to spooky locales. Yeah, I've driven through Maryland and had no idea it was uh, of spooky origins. Oh, yeah. So there's a lot of shit. I lived in Maryland for a little while uh, when I was in the Navy. And I would go trespassing all the time, do some, you know, urban exploration and all that good stuff. But Spook Hill is in Burkittsville. And it's a point where you go down a hill and you can turn your car around and like um, position yourself to start going uphill. You put the car in neutral without you applying your foot on the gas. Your car will start to climb uphill. I think I've heard of this. Is this the one where they claim they can see like handprints on the window? Yeah, but, you know. Who fucking knows? So there is the idea is that because Maryland, you know, just like the Northeast and all that good stuff, uh, Civil War, all that activity, all those ghosts, 
the idea is that dead soldiers in the Civil War will push your car up the hill, which is honestly a stretch. I'd, I'd rather enjoy the phenomena itself. Uh, I've linked in the show notes a link called Spook Hill. It links to an article that kind of explains things. And then there's a YouTube video where it's a few people in a car. The guy is at the bottom of the hill, puts it in neutral, consists of recording the whole time, hangs his feet outside the window, and sure enough, they start climbing uphill. It's bizarre. It's something to do with gravity. And not ghost. Gravity, not ghosts, yes. I do want to watch this. Because I want I want to know I want to know what the scientific explanation is behind behind that. Because it sounds very interesting. Of course you do, because you don't believe in ghosts. Correct. Because they're not real. It's something with magnets and what not? Who fucking knows? How do those work? The other two places that uh, I, I've absolutely been to and trespassed in many a time. And these are things that probably shouldn't be said out loud. But Forest Haven in Maryland was an abandoned institution that was uh, absolutely riddled with asbestos. And it was known for medical malpractice, things of that nature, and perhaps some abuse of its patients. And then the other spot was Hell House which was St. Mary's College, where there was rumored to have been an insane priest who slaughtered a bunch of girls who attended the college. Now it's completely torn down and is absolutely ruins. But there was a really creepy altar with a black crucifix up at the top. And it was such a fucking cool place to be at night. Yeah, I'm looking at these pictures and they're terrifying, especially the one with the asbestos hanging from the ceiling. Ugh. Even that's just creepy. It looks like bodies or something. I might day soon. Yeah, no thanks. I don't want mesothelioma. Can you call the number for the lawyers, though, if you went there? Or that's just if you lived in a place that had it? I think if you worked in a place that had it. So if you if they live if they work there, for sure. <laughs> if you or someone you know has died from visiting Hell House due to mesothelioma. That's exactly what it would be. There is one place that I do want to go, though, and it's called Daniels, Maryland. It is an abandoned town. So it was like an old mining town. And when they, uh, the, when the citizens got the notice that they had to move out, it was like a small town of like 90 people. They left absolutely everything behind. And now nature has just completely overrun it. Interesting. That kind of stuff is, is pretty cool though, to see like what remains when humans leave. It, it, to me, it's not even spooky. It's just like, it's just a sign of the future. I would think the past, but it's just so interesting because I, didn't know Marilyn was uh, this spooky and it's so close to us and it's kind of scary. So Mac, we know you do not believe in ghosts, but I have this uh, healthy relationship with ghosts. I know that they exist. I don't acknowledge them because they don't want to be acknowledged and I just go about my day, but it, there has to be ghosts. I mean, I think you'd be naive to not think that there is some sort of, I don't know, maybe this is the uh, Catholicism in me. No, I'm kidding. Uh <laughs> she says to the actual Catholic man, but also, would you consider ghosts to be among the healthiest relationships in your life? Probably. Maybe not at this point in my life. I have pretty good ones. But in my past, probably not. The ghosts were the better of the relationships I did have. <laughs> There's this idea of your soul having... um little soul helpers as you move on through the ages. And now I'm just thinking of you having a little support team of ghosts saying, drag him. No, move on. Or saying, say yes to the dress. You know what I mean? Like, you got a bunch of these little hype ghosts around you. I need them. I, I really do need them because some days I'm not sure what the hell I'm doing. It's just weird. Like how heavy you can feel in certain places like this, um, that are supposedly haunted. Uh, I went to the Charleston jail and I was really going to go by myself. And I was like, oh, it'll be cool going at night because I really thought it was just a museum, like lightly lit, very well lit, all this sort of stuff. My coworkers like, no, 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 we'll go with you and I'll bring my um, husband. So we go in there. One, this bitch just has a flashlight. And I'm like, oh, and then she's like, okay, make sure you lock the door behind you. I'm like, what the heck? And it's not in the best place in town in Charleston. And we go and she's telling these stories. And I know that's a part of the gimmick, but this stuff happened like they didn't know where to put people in the middle of the city so they buried them and the courtyard of this jail smelt bad and stunk the city up so i was like i totally believe that that has to carry some weight not just in our realm if that makes sense i think it it 
carries weight in our minds. And that's, okay. that's Whatever. why the idea of ghosts are, I think, effective for many people is because it is so effective in your brain. But in terms of reality, I, I don't think there's spirits floating through the air going like, man, my life a couple decades ago really sucked and I'm just going to chill here forever. And be- watch people live. I mean, come on. That's <laughs> scare him. <laughs> like, what would you do if you're like, okay, I'm going to be a ghost forever. I think eventually you're going to be like, you know, this is boring. I'm going to go like float over there and perhaps get some ghost beer and hang out. I don't like the word ghost. I like spirit better. Okay, sure. Sure. Spirit Airlines. I love it. But I just, I don't know. I'm not a ghost person. And I have family members who have told ghost stories. I have a cousin who states that, you know, she's talked to several ghosts in different houses. And don't you believe in the Holy Spirit, though? That's a ghost. It's the only one. It's the only one that's real. Okay. But like when you're going through a place that's spooky because the lights are low and because maybe you hear things or there's a smell, I think it's spooky because of those things and not necessarily because of an otherworldly presence unless it's asbestos maybe or <laughs> like natural gas leaking and affecting you. I mean, possibly, but I walked out of that place and one, I mean, one girl when we were coming in for the tour kind of like almost passed out. And then I was like, hell no, I'm not going in. I was literally clutching my friend's husband because I was like, oh my gosh. And she's like, if you look in the glass this way, you can, I'm like, nope, nope. Don't want to know what happened here. But when I did walk out of there, it just had this heavy presence that I didn't notice till I walked out. And I was like, who I feel like, I feel like I was myself again. And maybe that's just because I was tense. I don't know. She did say, don't go down this hallway. And then she's like, oh, we have to go turn the lights, all the main lights off. And I was like, is this a haunted house at this point? Where is, where is someone going to pop out? Oh, sweet, sweet Alexis. And this is why I don't do haunted houses. I don't do any of this shit. And I will never do something like that again. Okay, listen, at least a haunted house, you know what the fuck they're up to. You know the agenda. They're very transparent. They're going to pop out and spook you. You go to a, a tour of an allegedly actually haunted house and they're just gonna say oh we can't go down this hall oh wait we had to traverse the hallway in order to turn off the lights from whence we came what a conundrum (laughs) that does sound ridiculous now that i'm thinking about it i mean i've i've been to places like world war one and world war two like battle sites so it's like battlegrounds where thousands of people died i was in verdun france um and there's just like literally there's a there's a building and there's just like tons of bones of people who fell there and you can you can see them it's really insane they're like kept in this building in the bottom of it um so like that's super creepy but even there the vibe isn't like some say that they're still fighting to this day they're just like look it sucks that humans kill each other let's not do that anymore look how many people died because of this you know and so like in a place that should have nothing but ghost stories it's just like Look how much we suck when we're alive. Absolutely. I think what I find interesting are the places that claim or allege to have a more nefarious, sinister spirit. I don't believe it for a second, but I kind of want the spooky experience of that. Like, I'd like to go on a ghost tour and have something a little bit spooky happen. I don't need know that I'd believe in it, but I kind of want the thrill of it. And of all these places you've been, there's never been a circumstance where you're like, that doesn't seem real, possibly supernatural? No, because I was just trespassing. I was more afraid of getting caught by the cops. But it it felt eerie, absolutely. I don't know. It's like the rush of being somewhere you're not supposed to be. And it absolutely was creepy at night. One of the scariest nights was one of like, I think this might have been like the fourth time we went to Hell House. And it was a time when there was another group of people that were there, but they were coming up through the woods and not through the main stairs. So you could hear something and it it sounded like quiet whispering. But of course it was because there were other people there. But again, it's like the potential. You fall in love with the potential of finding a ghost. And that's where the real fun is. Not in actually being proven anything. I don't know. That's just me. And if Ryan were here, she'd say, there goes Chris Rojas falling in love with potential again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. The w- version that I found is 4K upscaled. Also, there is a fucking lizard climbing on my wall right now. <laughs> what? I was going to be real chill about it this whole time, but he's getting a little faster. So I'm just hoping that he doesn't try to climb on my bed. Would you like to see a picture of him? Yes. Oh, is that what you're taking a picture of? Yeah. He's a he's a little boy. Boop, boop. Actually, hold on. I'm see good. his peen? 
<laughs> what? How do you know it's a boy? I don't know. He's a chonk. Oh, no, he's, he's little. Okay. Aw. He's got like gecko feet. Aw. Mm. It's good. Uh, they eat the bugs. You know, he's too small to eat any of the roaches that I've ever had in my room, so. Oh, his tail is burning. He's like, a, he's like a cat. Oh, what are you doing, dude? I don't like this. Okay, we'll carry on. Can you spray him with something? I don't want to harm him because I do like lizards. He's climbing behind my audio acoustic form, so we're, okay. He's good. He's he's behind the, the foam panels. See, I don't like that because then you don't know where they're at. Beyond that, I think one of the things that surprised me most was that in this rewatch there was actually something from one of our past episodes and i can't believe that i did not draw the connection between taylor gentry from behind the mask the rise of leslie vernon and heather donahue from this movie i am ashamed of myself for not putting those two together because taylor was giving us her best heather and i also want to point out that a team of men 10 years later, marketed Jennifer's body, and all they could come up with was Megan Fox is hot, but three women were the brains and brilliance behind this movie's marketing campaign. I'm just saying. Is this um, the one where they had the website, too? Yes, it is. Okay, okay. I'm not, like, making things up. Yeah, I said it in the intro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can take it out. Oh, Sorry, just take it out. Going along with characters. So Heather's monologue in the beginning reminds me of, remember that show, um, I don't know if it's like, believe it or not, but it had a guy with the, the goatee and he just go, and on tonight's episode, or it reminded me of Unsolved Mysteries, but it was just very like fake and I just did not like that whatsoever. That monologue was trash. I'm curious if you're talking about Ripley's Believe It. Um, you had to say a best part. Oh, yeah. You do have to say a best part. Oh, fuck. I have to say a best part. Because oh, <laughs> I, in my head, was going to slash this earlier today. 